you are about to be shocked by the revelation that you're about to receive. You're going to have to pick your jaw up off the ground because we have a guest with us tonight who you know, best-selling author of the tremendous book, The Harbinger. But this latest book, I believe, is the most important book he has ever written. The Return of the Gods is a revelation concerning the ancient gods of old being resurrected, being revived in our modern American culture. We all know it's possible for an individual to be possessed, but is it possible for a culture, for a nation, for a society to be possessed? Is America demonically possessed? You may have seen interviews with him, but you've not seen an interview like this where we take time to dig into the revelation and Rabbi Jonathan Kahn is gonna be sharing what he believes is next for the nation and for the church. Before we dive into this interview, I wanna hear from you. What are you expecting to hear? What questions do you have? Where are you watching from? Write it down there in the comments and make sure you share this. I believe this revelation is one of the most important revelations that has been released in recent time and every Christian needs it. So share, 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 tell people about it. Call someone right now, text them, tell them. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn is live with Pastor Alan DiDio right now. This revelation is urgent and I believe it's gonna transform your life. Let's head into this interview and let's receive of this revelation, the return of the gods. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, it's so good to have you back on Encounter today. Now, always great to be with you. I, I was really blessed the first time. And also what I've what I've learned about your ministry, I'm very blessed. Well, thank you. And the last time we connected with you and your lovely wife, you were releasing a movie, The Harbingers of Things to Come. And we haven't spoken since then. So how'd that go? Uh, went, went great. Um, yes, it it, it, you know, you know, we just, you know, the, the publisher, Charisma, wants to do, you know, a, a visual form of the books. And so we did not thinking that it would go to the theaters, um, but it did. And what happened was um, on it was it was for like it was to be for a night and then it was it was carried to another. And, but uh, when it as it debuted, it was they told us it was the number two movie in America. They, what, wow. It was just be, just behind Doctor Strange. <laughs> so we're <competing laughs> with, um, but so God did. And, I, and what I heard even more importantly, that across the country and many of the theaters, including the one that I stuck into, um, people ended with spontaneous prayer for America. So, yes. um, it, you know, it went forth. And now and now it's it's the harbingers of things to come. And they put it uh, recently. It's it, it's gone out in DVD. So if people missed it um, or if they saw it and they want it, it's it's should be all over um, the harbinger of things to come. It's tremendous. We went we took people to the theaters. We we it was it was amazing. What an amazing evangelistic opportunity. And if people haven't had a chance, they need to get a hold of it. Have a little Bible study in your home. Invite your friends over. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, people will give their lives to the Lord after watching this. And as I gotta say, as as amazing as the Harbinger is, and it's you know, groundbreaking, that type of book, that type of prophetic look at American, American history. This book, and you've written many others, but The Return of the Gods, and we're going to put a link in the description of this video. I told you before we got started, I think it's the most important book you've ever written. It's the most dynamic book that I've read in a long, 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 long time. I need to know, as an author, what, what was the impetus of this? And how did, how did the idea of this begin to spark in your spirit? Well, this, uh, the revelation, the overall revelation had come to me a while back. Actually, I, I did a message right after I wrote The Harbinger. Um, I, I did a message at Beth Israel, where the congregation is, um, and it was called The Dark Trinity. And because I, I've seen this link for a long time, but I, and I knew that one day I had to write a book, but it, it had to be the right time. And then I started feeling more and more that you know, it's the right time. America is racing away from God, and it is it is under the influence of these entities, these these spirits. Um, and so, I started during the lockdown. Um, I started, you know, going deeper and deeper, and, and more and more and more and more came. Um, and then I started trying to write it. Um, you know, and I could not because so much, it was so much warfare happening mm. and I was getting so, I was, had to deal with so many things outside of writing that I couldn't write it. Um, so finally, when we got to 2020, I said, okay, you know, Lord, I said, I'm, I'm, no matter what, I'm writing this. And so on, on January 1st, 2020, I wrote the first sentence and <laughs> that was it. Said, no matter what, I'm breaking ground. Um, and I did, and it, you know, it took a few months and, uh, it then and then you know I finished it. Well, I finished it 
uh, on a very, very kind of amazing date. We might touch on it. Uh, but then, you know, then it came out in September. But I knew it was for now. I mean, I, I knew that. And I also knew that it was going to be explosive and who knows what was going to happen. But, you know, it's gone forth and I, I know it's the Lord. So let's dive into that then, that that concept of the dark trinity. And this is going to take us in a lot of different directions here. So how did that develop in your heart, in your spirit? And then explain to us what it is. Yeah, well, when I looked at what happened to ancient Israel, when they turned away from God, uh, there were three particular spirits, gods, that came in, that they went after and that destroyed them. And I saw that the same the same three spirits or the same entities, principalities are at work as America has turned away from God. Um, and, and this goes back just as maybe to set the stage um, that, you know, the, the return of the gods, I mean, you know, it, it opens up a mystery that, that is very clearly in the Bible, but many believers miss it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that mm-hmm. is that the first thing is that behind the gods of the ancient world, our spirits, the Bible says it in Deuteronomy. Uh, it, it says that it says that they worshipped these idols, these gods. But it says in Hebrew they worshipped the Shedim, and the word Shedim means literally entities, spirits with will, with volition, with consciousness. Then it's it also in the Psalm. It says Psalm one hundred six. It also says the same thing. They worship the Shedim, um, and then in, when it was translated into Greek, when the rabbis had to translate the word Shedim, they translated it into the word. The daimonia, we get the word demon from it or demonic from it. And so when Paul in Corinthians, first Corinthians, he speaks about the pagan world worshiping the idols. He says they worship the the de, daimonia or the demonic spirits or or again, the shedim. And so what it's the first thing the Bible is saying is that behind these things is not just these are not just figments of imagination. Yes, there is fiction. There is mythology, all that. But what it's saying is there is also a spiritual realm behind these gods are spirits. And that's the first thing. So the second thing is that the premise of this, that in the pagan world, they were given to the gods. So what that means is they were also given to the spirits. And when you look at the pagan world, pagan culture, you see the signs of demonic possession all over the culture. Um, I mean, in fact, they even they they speak about it. It's all, almost every culture um, that was worshiping God speaks about demonic possession. They may not call it demonic. They may say they're possessed by the gods, Mm -hmm. but it's the same thing. They're shaking and they're foaming at the mouth and they're babbling. And, you know, when you go to the the ancient world, that, you know, the height of of the pagan revelation was the Oracle of Delphi. This is a woman who was possessed. It says that she was possessed by the God, but she was possessed by a spirit and she was shaking and trembling and and babbling and you know this was demonic. So so the, the thing is that th- this is what the world was. In fact, Western civilization these are not just cultures with possession; they were possessed cultures. You know, mm. it's not just people that can be possessed; a civilization can be possessed. And that's that's what the gospel came into, and that's what changed everything. Well, for so for all of human history, and this is startling how you lay it out in the book. And by the way. There's, the book is nothing but meat. There's no way we can get into all of the details that you lay out in this. So we're just going to skip across the pond of the depth of this revelation. But uh, you go into the detail of how all of human history is dominated by these demonic entities, these gods, until Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden they're toppled. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that is, you know, like what happened to these gods? You know, most of them, what happened to them was Jesus, Yeshua, Mm -hmm. Messiah. He comes. And not only he comes, and notice that he has the power, in the Greek it says of ekbalo, to cast out. So he's power over the spirits. But he has power over the gods. He sends his disciples into the world. This is the first time in power, in fullness, the word of God is coming into the pagan world. So it's God coming into the world of the gods. It's the spirit coming into the world of the spirits. And it's a, it's a war that goes on. When you look at the book of Acts, that's what you see, a war. You have, you know, this mm-hmm. demon-possessed uh, gr- slave girl is following Paul, stalking him until he casts her out. Then there's an uproar in the city over it. Then in another city, there's an uproar over the gods. The first, uh, you know, the great persecutions of the of Christians was over the gods. They said, if you just worship, worship our God, and you will you will not be hurt. But if you don't, we're going to cast you in prison. We're going to torture you. We're going to throw you to the lions. It was a war of the gods, and it makes sense because you know if you if you picture this, you know what would be against the gospel? What would be threatened by the gospel? These spirits. 
But in the end, the the gospel triumphs and the gods depart. The the temples of Zeus become uh, abandoned. The the shrines of Athena are are desolate. You know, they in fact, even the oracles, you know, the, these women who are possessed start saying that we can't hear from the gods anymore. Hmm. And so what happens is it is the it is the twilight of the gods, but if behind the gods are spirits, what it means is the coming of the gospel to Western civilization, it was the greatest mass exorcism in human history. That's what it was. It was the casting out of spirits. And that is what makes the West, has made the West so unique. It has been a, a, a an exorcised civilization. But the thing is, if, you know, these spirits don't die, these spirits are still there. So what what that means, they could return. They actually could come back if they are given the opening. And for that, there's actually a warning, an ancient warning that Jesus gives that people don't realize the full meaning of it, but it actually is a prophecy of what's happening right now. Well, this is when you start talking about the house of the spirits, right? This is when you get into that mystery. And while we're here, we might as well unlock that. So so these yeah. demons have been expelled, and now what we're seeing in culture is like a reverse exorcism that's taken place, yeah. which has yes. opened the door to this House of the Spirit's revelation. Talk to us about yes. that. Yeah, that, that's a great way of saying it. It's a reverse exorcism. It's a repossession. Hmm. In, in what interesting, Alan, because in, in the other sense, you could say, you know, what's happened is we've been exercising God. Wow. From the culture. And so therefore we have a reverse exorcism. So, yeah. So Jesus gives this parable and he says, and, and many people are familiar with it, but they don't always grasp the, the significance here. He says, if a spirit leaves a man, he says it, it wanders the earth seeking for a place, but it cannot find it. So it says, I will go back to my house. The spirit is calling the man his house because he inhabits it. And so he says, I'll go back. So he goes back finds the, quote, house, the man, clean, swept, you know, empty, says, I'm going to go back, gets gets seven other demonic spirits, and there, it says they're more evil than the first, brings them back to the man or the house, they repossess the house, and, and, and the Lord says that the latter state of the man is worse than the first. Well, okay, but now that people think, well, that's just talking about a man and possession and you should not once you're delivered by God you don't turn back well that's all true but at the end of it in in, in Matthew it says so it shall be with this generation oh. not just a man but a generation so this opens up a whole nother revelation we said that it's not just people who can be possessed cultures can be possessed under possession so here is the warning now taking it to the most global application and that is this any culture, any nation, any civilization that has been delivered, exercised by the power of God, if it turns away from God, if it turns back, if it empties itself of God, then the house is not going to remain empty. Wow. Something else is coming into it. And what's going to happen is the spirits that were cast out of it are going to come back. So for Western civilization, if the West ever turns back away from God, the spirits, the ancient spirits that were cast out of it when the gospel came are going to return into it. The gods are going to return. And when they return, they're going to seek to repossess the culture, repossess the West, possess America, which is part of this, the West. And they will seek. Now, the thing is that, remember, these are pagan spirits. So, but now they're coming back to a house that has been cleansed, that it's a Judeo-Christian civilization that they're coming back to. So the mission is to take a Judeo-Christian civilization and turn it into a pagan one. And that is exactly what has been happening. You want to understand, talking about everybody out there, you want to understand what's been happening to America for the last half century, it is this. We are witnessing a repossession. We are witnessing a the process of paganization. And remember what Jesus said the latter state will be worse than the first. So what it means is that what we are heading into is going to be worse than the pagan world that was cast out. Wow. And if people thought, by the way, the, the history and the revelation and the harbinger was something as far as the timing of things, you're not ready for the return of the gods because it is absolutely astounding as you break down what's happened over the last, I don't know, five decades um, in the United States with the rise of the dark Trinity. So let's step into that then. Let's let's yeah. talk about the dark Trinity and its return 
to America? Is there a specific time when the door was opened for them to yes. enter in? Yeah. Yeah. The, the looking at what happened to Israel, that's kind of the test case because Israel knew God, turned away from God. And then this this thing happened to them. They, they were literally went after other gods and they were possessed by those spirits. They turned into a pagan nation. Well, the same dark trinity is at work. It was it was three particular gods. Now there were other gods, but these were the these were the epitome gods. And and the thing is that the first one was called the possessor. Um, that's what his name meant. You know, we we've we've heard of his name, but the name means the possessor. In Hebrew, his name was Baal, mm-hmm. which we know as Baal. But it means literally the one who possesses or the one who owns the one the 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 owner the possessor the the um the 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 lord actually even means so so the thing is that what it's saying here is if america turns away from god or the west turns away from god this spirit is coming back this is the spirit that turned israel away from god that that turned a, 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 a nation that knew God into a pagan one. And when you look like, well, when did this happen? When do we, we had to open the door because that can't happen if we don't open the door. Well, the door would be opened if we start emptying ourselves, our culture of God. When does that happen? Early 60s, we begin to empty our culture of God, step by step. Beginning, first we take prayer out of school, the early 60s. Then we take the word out of school, and then it keeps going. So what we're doing is we're doing exactly what Jesus warned us, in a, in a sense, never to do. We're emptying the house. And if we empty the house, you know, for instance, back then, when they took out prayer from school, you know, they, they were taking out, they're take, basically separating the, the younger generation from God. And when you take that out, it, the house is not going to remain empty. You take God out, something else is going to come into the school, and it's here now. Something's going to come into the children, it's here now. It's Something else is coming in. So the spirit of Baal, or Baal, the possessor, begins to move in the culture. And what did Baal do in ancient times with Israel? Well, what he did, first thing is, he start, it started driving God out of everything, driving God's presence. Look, think about the days of Elijah, drove God out of the public squares. Well, that spirit is in America, began coming to the surface in the early 60s. It has been working ever since, driving God out of entertainment, God out of the out of the out of government, God out of discourse, out of everything. Well, we're witnessing that. What else did Baal do? Baal also, it says he caused Israel to forget God. Well, so what has happened to America? Not only this, there's a spirit that's caused this amnesia that we're forgetting God, the God of our foundation. But not only that, we're forgetting that we ever knew God. You know, we we are, we have been, the changes that have been coming to America are all in the direction of paganization. We're, we're, We're becoming a pagan nation that has forgotten that it ever knew God. And when you think back, I mean, I mean, think back, Alan, not that we, we could remember it. I mean, but we know of it. That the 1950s, you know, you have a culture where actually the teachers of America are leading the school children yeah. in secular schools are leading them in the Lord's Prayer. They are actually we, the, the big movies are, are have names like Ben Hur, Ten Commandments, Quo Vadis. You know, um, there is you know, there is there is prayer on there is the gospel on television, on, on network television. Well, well, those days are long gone. That you know, that America could not fathom this America. Mm-hmm. And this America cannot re- barely remember that America. But that is what has happened. And the other thing about, you know, the spirit of Baal is that it, it has affected us in, in all sorts of ways we don't even realize. First of all, he, it says he caused Israel to turn away from the ways and commands of God. Well, this spirit has literally caused America to strike down the Ten Commandments, remove it from the public square, just like with Israel. But also even things like wokeism is all rooted in this spirit of this pagan spirit. Example, when you have a a monotheistic culture, there's one God, one truth. But in pagan culture, you don't have that. You have many gods and many truths. So therefore, we have this new thing that's coming to our culture where you don't have the truth anymore. Everybody has their own, quote, authentic truth. If a man says that I'm not a man, I'm a cat, well, then you have to, he has to be called a cat because that's his truth. There's no more truth anymore. That's his truth. That's pagan. Yeah, that's not enlightened. That's wokeism. That's pagan. If a woman says I'm not a she, I'm a they, that is, and that's her authentic truth, that is paganism. It is, a, here's another way, another way it's affected. In the pagan world, there the line between man and animal was was all 
merge was mm. was blurred. And you see it when you look at the, the images of the gods, they're part yeah. animal, part man. Look at Baal, part has has uh, horns of a bull and is a man. So so ba- you know they did that in clay images, but today we're doing it, we're merging it through the genetic code. Not not just clay. We're actually doing it that way. Here's another way that you people would not necessarily think about it. When you take away God, everything becomes God. You know, when you know the, the Baal, if the Bible says not only Baal, it says there were Baals, you know, the Baalim. You know, and Baal means master. So therefore, the thing is that there were many masters. So what happens when you when you say, hey, we're going to be free of God, what happens is you become mastered by everything, sexuality. You become mastered by materialism. We are more mastered. We are more addicted now than ever in our history. And and there's something in the Bible, you know, where it says that they what they they worship the works of their own hands. Well, well, listen, this is what's happened to America. You know, that when Paul speaks about paganism on Mars Hill, he said when he speaks about the, the idols, he uses the word techne, <laughs> techne. We get the word technology, tech, wow. from this. So what's it saying is that if man turns away from God, he will start worshiping, serving his own technology. Well, we're doing that. We are ad- people, we are addicted to the computer. You know, people are addicted. And you know what the Bible says? It says they become like their idols. In other words, they make the idols to look like them, and then they become like their idols. Well, the computer, our computers are becoming increasingly taking the powers of humanity, and people are becoming less and less human. They're becoming like their computer. So this has affected us in every way. Well, yeah, I think someone once said that God made man in his image, and then man returned the favor. Um, as you dig into this, it seems like Baal is almost like an inverse John the Baptist and that he is preparing the way for these other spirits. He's, he's, he's removing every semblance of God, of Christ in culture, and then preparing the way for who is That's always right. with him, the enchantress. Yes. Who is she? That, that is the, absolutely, you know, and I would say this, in many ways, he's like that spirit in the parable. He's like the mm-hmm. first one that yes. comes to the house. Then he says, I'm going to get my friends. Let me just throw one thing and then we'll go right to that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and that is that there is this one, you know, uh, uh, there is one sign of Baal, his his possession of a culture over any. And that is he was represented by the form of a bull, a molten mm. bronze bull all over the Middle East. Well, could that happen to America? The sign appear in America, it already has. Go to New York City, go yes. to where the Harlingers are, and you will find a molten, massive, molten bronze bull. And, and this is the image of Baal. And the Bible, you know, people didn't know what they were doing, but it doesn't matter. The, the mystery is going to manifest. It, it is a sign of a, of a culture that has become possessed by the possessor, that has turned from God in the Bible and turned to the gods, and that you will find it on, actually, on near Wall Street. In fact, even the sign of what's this, you know, Baal was the god of prosperity. You know, he would give you prosperity to your fields. Well, the sign of prosperity in America is a bull. What do we call the stock market? A bull market. It's bullish. Well, we've actually used the actual image of Baal. But as you said, yeah, he's the preparer, the first of the Trinity. And so he had a wife. And, and in the Bible, she's called Ashtora. And it, but she was all over. She was the wife of Baal or the consort of Baal in Canaanite mythology, but she's all over. One of the most ancient principalities in on planet Earth. Um, in the in Babylon, she was called Ishtar. In in Sumer, she was called Inanna. In the in Phoenicia, she's called Astart, kind of like Ashtora. And in in the Greeks called her Aphrodite, and the Romans called her Venus. Now, now we think, hey, Venus, that sounds like a nice. There's nothing nice about this thing. Mm-hmm. This principality is this is the principality of unbridled sexual lust immorality. This is she was actually a harlot. She's actually a prostitute goddess. They had hymns to her praising her for being a prostitute. She is the one who sexualizes a culture. Ancient, much of ancient pagan culture was sexualized. Her temples were filled with with the act of sexuality in the public square. I mean, it was a public thing. And so what she does now, now think about it. What's going to happen if now this one comes in? You first has Baal, then comes, I'll call her Ishtar or the goddess. She comes in. What we would expect to happen is there be a revolution in the realm of sexuality? That is exactly what wow. happens to America in the West. What happened? And like clockwork, first Baal, early 60s, 
Then comes the sexual revolution. These are these have the fingerprints of the goddess. All these things that we call sexual revolution we're supposed to be enlightened, you know, we're free. These have all moved in the direction of pagan sexuality. You know, you know, the the the, the biblical morals concerning sexuality lasted for about 2,000 years. They were basically the same when you got into the 60s. And then everything changed. Once we turn away from God, hmm. this is going to happen. This, so the, the sexual revolution, which has not stopped, ha, is all about this, this principality. She seduces a culture. She, she paganizes a culture through the realm of sexuality. And remember, she's a prostitute. What does a prostitute do? A prostitute takes sex out of the, of the marriage bed and puts it into the culture, into the marketplace. Well, that's what's happened to America. And the goddess, you know, she's a she's a prostitute, and a prostitute is against marriage, works against marriage, undermines marriage. Well, look at what's been happening at the same time. As the sexual revolution, she has weakened marriage. Marriages in America have been attacked. This is she 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 breaks them, she destroys them, comes divorce, comes premarital, comes, you know, the marriage covenant has been in proportion to the sexual revolution, has been uh, has been devastating. And the other thing is that, you know, the ancient Greeks, remember, she's a prostitute. The ancient Greeks would when they would call her a prostitute, they use the Greek word. The Greek word for prostitute is the word porne, mm -hmm. porn. We get the word porn from it and pornography. Now, that's not an accident because this principality is actually the oldest uh, deity on record, like, you know, recorded. And the earliest pornography in the world is, is her literature. It's the first pornography. She's the inventor of pornography. The, when she was around in the, when she took over a culture, not only was, was the writings, the writings pornographic, but Images. She spread images of naked women all over, you know, naked, you know, and, and sexual acts. Well, well, now pornography has exploded. She seduces a culture through pornography. This is her work. And, you know, we talk about, you know, erotic, you know, erotic culture, the eroticization of America. Well, the word erotic comes from the Greek eros. Eros was a god, a deity whose mother was this goddess. Mm. This goddess gave birth to eros and Pornography. So this is, and, and I'm just going to throw this in. Of course, we don't have time because there's so much, as you know. <laughs> yeah. But this goddess was also the goddess of intoxication. She intoxicated people. Notice when the sexual revolution explodes, at the same time comes an explosion of drugs, of dr a drug culture, which is still with us, by the way. Um, and so she is the intoxicator, and and she is also a sorceress. Uh, more spells were linked to this goddess than any other. And and so at the same moment in the 60s, when the sexual revolution comes, you know what else comes? A revival of the occult, witchcraft, you know, tarot cards, Ouija boards, horoscopes, psychic hotlines, you know, new age. All this starts coming in, has it up, you know, to the point that today there are more witches in America than there are Presbyterians. Yeah. And so they, they, they are taken after the image of their goddess. She has seduced America. Well, it's fascinating. And I think this gets into uh, the history of the Stonewall movement that you dive into in the book as far as its timing. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah. There, there was something strange about the God. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of things strange about the goddess, but <laughs> but something strange that I found when I went. And this is this, Alan, you asked me about like when the start. Well, you know, initially, you know, the thing about the 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 revelation about the the dark trinity was a, a number of years ago where it came. But now in during the lockdown, as I'm going through the ancient Mesopotamian tablets and inscriptions, it, it's blowing me away. Which, by it the says, way, you walk us through in the book, these ancient Mesopotamian tablets, you walk through these in the book and it's it's startling. Yeah. And one of one of the one of the inscriptions says she says where the goddess says, I am a woman. I am a man. It says, hmm. she says, it says, uh, one of the hymns to the goddess says, you have the power to turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man. This is the goddess or the principality that blurs the lines of sexuality, of gender, wow. male and female, man and woman. She confused, she turns one into the other and the other into the one. So what would happen 
if she comes back. Now, now the thing is, it's amazing because this is exactly what we are all witnessing now and dealing with now. It is affecting everything. This is the work. Now, at the beginning, when she first comes in, you don't see it all because it's the sexual revolution. But, you know, this is this is deeper. The, you know, she can't can't expose all this. But as she takes possession of a culture, as the sexual revolution takes possession of a culture, as she's destroying marriage, man, woman, you know, then this part is going to start manifesting more and more the the destruction of gender and and this is and Alan this could be seen in everything I mean I mean and you know we didn't even you know we're seeing the the very blatant part now but it was happening for instance it said one of the ancient inscriptions says she grinds away the masculinity of men and she so she she's the goddess who who feminizes men and emasculates them. And she's also the goddess that masculinizes women and defeminizes them. And so you see this happening in culture. There's a spirit, you know, where, where men are being increasingly, you know, attacked. She attacked, by the way, she, att- she hated male authority. She raged against it. So you have this anger in the culture against men and male authority, but also you have, you have the, the removal of men from fatherhood, the removal of men from marriage, the removal of men as, as what they are, providers, protectors, you know, um, you have a whole generation. And at the same time, you have the, the defeminization of women. You have the removal of women from motherhood, the removal of women from marriage, the removal of women from man. And they're, it's separating man from woman and woman from man. That's what she does. And so we're, and, and the thing was, the goddess, you know, she, she was female, but she had male attributes. So she's making modern women after her own image. And this goes now to deeper, as you, you alluded to, that it's not just that, it goes into the realm of sexuality. She is the goddess of androgyny. It says she she dresses men in the clothing of women. She dresses women in the clothing of men. In fact, I found an inscription where it, it describes the transition men dancing before the goddess, holding scalpels as they dance, as if to celebrate they're transitioning. And, and see things, remember that that the Lord said that the latter state will be worse than the first. Well, in the beginning state, the pagan state, the original state, she she possessed a priesthood. But now she is seeking to possess an entire generation of children. She is confused. You know, the gods are always after the children. And and they because if you get the children, you have the culture. You know, if you get the children, you have the future. That's why the children, children are now being confused. They're being trained from infancy. And, you know, remember we, we spoke about, you know, we removed prayer from school. Like now, could they have imagined that this is now going to come in? But that's what the mystery says. Yes, this is coming in. This is what was cast out. You know, when we, we, Alan, we, uh, when we removed God, you know, America had no idea what it was doing, you know, because right. this was the only thing, the gospel, the faith was the only thing protecting it for all those years against this darkness coming in. Well, now it's come in. And so this is what's happening to the children. We can ask, even non-believers are saying, this is madness. You know, how can adults do this to children? What po- what would possess them? Well, this would possess them. Wow. And that's where we are now. And this opens the door. You, you mentioned this, and this is a way to kind of set the stage as well. That, you know, the movement that really did all this, that opened the door for all this is and some people know it. Some people don't. It's called Stonewall. Mm-hmm. And this happened, of course, in New York City, where the bull, where the sign of, of, of bail was, where the sign of like all these things began. Um, and it happened at the end of the 60s. And it was uh, uh, it was basically um, the, the police raided a same sex bar and the, the, the patrons revolted and they, it was a riot and it was violent and they actually st- sought to storm the, the bar with a policeman barricaded in there and set it on fire and it was a whole thing. That, the bar was called Stonewall and this is what has begun. Everything that we see right now was, you know, exploded, was launched by Stonewall, the parades, everything, celebrate Stonewall. Well, the amazing thing when I'm looking at this, I'm seeing all these signs of the goddess appeared manifested on that night. Example, there's so much, I'll just give a little taste of it. One thing is that when the goddess went to war, and this was kind of like the beginning of this culture war, when she goes to war, the, one of the signs is the sign that appears is the sign of the lion or the lion's head. This was linked to the goddess. Actually, at Stonewall was the sign of the lion's head. Another thing was that it's called the Dance of Ishtar. When she goes to war, it says the goddess dances and there's destruction. Well, in the middle of the riot, 
a dance breaks out and the people who are dancing are actually saying words that go back to the tablets and the inscriptions of the goddess without knowing what they're doing. There was a woman there who actually triggered the whole riot. And it's and and actually she was like she was almost like uh, an embodiment of the goddess and and you know the goddess was called storm you know the 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 hymn said you are the loud thundering storm you 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 use storms to do this you are the storm well the name of the woman was storm or storm a and mm-hmm. and the the other thing was you know we said Stonewall where's that from you know they try to break into Stonewall. Well, Stonewall, and by the way, I didn't even throw this in. The, the place where the goddess especially inhabited was bars, was taverns. The ancient inscription says this was almost like her temple. Well, it all began in a bar. And the thing is, there's an ancient inscription where it says of the goddess, actually, this is the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, where it says, you are the stone that breaks the stone wall." the stone wall. She is, she is linked to the stone wall from the beginning and she rages at, you know, she, there's so much to this, but I will just mention even the timing of this that began the movement, it all happened according to the calendar that the sacred days of the goddess happened in the month of the goddess, happened under the full moon of the goddess, happened around the summer solstice of the goddess. It all happened like clockwork according to the ancient mystery. As, as you pile this up, the, the concept of coincidence just kind of evaporates as you lay out the case for all of this. In particular, what you just mentioned, the month of the goddess. Yes. Tell us about that. That's yeah. really fascinating. Yeah, there was one month of the year that she claimed, you know, the goddess claimed more than any other to, in a sense, possess the culture. Uh, and in fact, when I say that, it wasn't, you know, there were different festivals, but this is one where basically the spirit of the goddess actually inhabits the people. They start acting like the goddess. Um, and you even see a hint of it in the book of Ezekiel. It says the women are weeping for Tammuz. Well, Tammuz was a lover of the goddess. And the thing is that that it was the you know when when I looked back and I looked at the early Christian writings and I looked because this thing, these these festivals were still taking place in the early age you know as the gospel came and so I looked and I looked at the writings I put in the book the right the return of the gods the writings of Saint Jerome Saint Jerome identifies the month of the goddess and he called the month of the festival and he calls it in Latin the month of Iunium or Junium or June. The month of the goddess in our Western calendar was equivalent to June. So look at what has happened to June. You know, this is the repossession. Remember, Jesus said that the, the spirit goes back to its house. Well, 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 the goddess inhabited June, basically. And so now she has gone back to the inhabit June again. So June has been transformed, and June is now the month of called Pride Month. Well, you know, the goddess was called the goddess of pride. And what also was the goddess of, of, of the god the patron of? Parades. She was the goddess of parades. I found all sorts of inscriptions that say the people of Sumer, they parade before you, they parade before you. Not just did she initiate parades, but it says it, it describes the parades. The parades, it says it was men parading through the city streets dressed as women. It was women parading through the city streets dressed as men. It was sexual licentiousness, and it was the bending of gender. Well, they're back. And, you know, this is, you know, this is like, it would be a big, a mystery, like, how did this happen? Why did this take over culture? I mean, how do nations that only give, they give one day to their own, their own birthday, they give 30 days to sexual, this sexuality? That's, that's not natural. That's that's not natural at all. It is supernatural. And what it is, is it's the return of the goddess. It's the return of her parades. It's the return of her priesthood. And the thing is that now here's another thing that we wouldn't know because, our you know, we don't have long term memories. But actually, it was the gospel coming in and it was Constantine that I found ancient references where Constantine basically put an end to these things. And so it was, you know, so now if you're seeing the return, it means the gospel is being pushed out. The 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 restraining force is being removed. So this is what happens. And I'm not, listen, not saying that the people who are doing it have any idea they're doing it. That makes it even more amazing that they're doing it according to the ancient mystery. Yeah, it's it, one of the things I had to pick my jaw up off the desk when I was reading it, and you were you were talking about the rainbow in connection with this and how we know that it is a symbol of God's covenant, but now we know it's a symbol of, of a particular movement in America. And we would think that the colors, yeah, they probably represent something like liberation and tolerance and that <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. No, no, not at all. Talk to us no. about that. 
Yeah, the in, yeah in the book, yeah, I, I put where every color has a meaning by what not what I'm saying. It's what they, the people who did it said, and it, as you said, it's it's not what you would think. You would think it would be yeah, equality, freedom, what liberation, whatever. It's not at all. Every one of those colors is you know it, it almost doesn't even go together, Alan. You know, I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. There's nothing really holding it together. Yet the only thing that holds it together is the goddess, because all of those all of the meanings that they gave to the colors, they all link up to the goddess and you know the and on top of that i mean that when i look back you know the, the goddess in the ancient inscriptions she is linked to the rainbow there is an ancient inscription that says uh manzat ishtar and the word ishtar is the goddess manzat means rainbow they call it rainbow ishtar um there's a there's an inscription i found where it says the goddess's eyes were as rainbows there's another thing where it says she lifts up her necklace basically like a rainbow and then there's there's a there's a mystery in there that that has to do with the goddess in uh, enlarging herself, actually enacting vengeance and warring, and she does it through the rainbow. She, she says she she stretches across the sky as the rainbow to accomplish her will. Now, I'm not going to get into the detail, but if people realize this, I, I think that some people would have second thoughts about waving this thing because this is a dark symbol linked mm. to the war of the goddess and linked to an agenda of vengeance. So these things these things are like dominoes now they're falling. So you have Baal, he comes and removes every semblance of God from culture or else we would not participate in what the enchantress invites us into. But then the enchantress leads us into the destroyer who in my view, as I'm reading it, seems to remove in a way in our minds the consequences of these actions in, in some way, shape or form. So talk to us about the destroyer. Yeah, or or yes, or you could say the the ultimate consequence of all this because one leads to the other. So you, yeah, you had Baal, okay, the opening, the turning away from God. Then that leads to Ishtar, sexual revolution, and then it leads to the third, who in the book is called the Destroyer, and this is the god or the principality that causes parents or cause parents to offer up their own children as sacrifices and so you know this is a pagan thing you know you know back then you know it was not safe in a pagan culture it was not safe to be a a, a child um, they would offer up children the human sacrifice and child sacrifice was common and especially around the, the nation that surrounded israel and so this is you know we we call him molech which actually means king um, and so this when israel turned away from god they started offering up their children just like the pagan nations did. Mm. And the thing is, you know, this is really the most pagan act. And the one thing, you know what, you know what ended this in the world? It was the gospel that ended it. Yes. It was Jesus. It was the name of Jesus, Messiah, that drove out this practice of killing children. But the warning of Jesus is that if we ever turn away from God, these gods, these principles are coming back. And so like clockwork, you know, you have the 1960s, you have that, and then at the end of the 60s, 1970, you have all of a sudden the return of the killing of children, the most pagan act. They say, well, this is enlightened. Nothing enlightened. This is pagan. We are offering up our own children. And remember, Jesus said they come back worse. Well, well, you know, in the ancient world, Israel killed thousands of its children. We have killed millions, 60 million and more of our children. It comes back worse. And when I looked at, you know, I know we don't have time for it, but when, in the book, I, I show how it actually parallels the ancient rites of child sacrifice. Abortion actually is paralleling it. I mean, example, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the children that were offered up to this God more than any other children. It was the poor, the children of the poor. They actually mm. paid poor people for their children. Well, what is what children are being offered up in abortion more than any other the poor children of the poor you know why did why did any you know parent why could a parent offer up their children well they were told if you do this you're going to get blessed you know the god is going to bless you financially going to bless your fields going to bless your give you prosperity well why are women told to do this because they say if you have the child you're going to hinder your career you're going to hinder your future you're going to hinder your success and so the same reasons, and, and I even put in the book, you know, they consider this, the ancients consider this to be a sacred act, a sacrament. Well, I actually put in the book the, the actual direct quotes of abortionists and radical feminists saying abortion is a sacred act. It is a sacrament. It is a sacrifice. Even to the gods, it is something holy. Well, this has now come back 
I mean, it's all come back, and this has come back as well. You know, it was Dr. Lester Summerall who said that Satan takes possession of an individual inch by inch and pinch by pinch. And we've seen that happen in culture, as you've so beautifully laid out. And in the, it, this didn't happen overnight. It, it's it's amazing what's happened, which brings me to, I don't know if you have a second to talk about this, the avatars, uh, the Sanskrit meaning of the word avatar and how that applies to what we're seeing right now in uh, in America. Yeah, the God, well, the God thing, the gods possess, you know, they possess, these are spirits. They need, yeah. they need hosts, you know, and so they will, they will possess, like I mentioned that one in the, you know, in, uh, at Stonewall, the one who actually triggered it, I'm sure she had no idea what she was doing, but she's doing it. Um, and even her name, I mean, you know, you know, and so, so these people, they don't know what they're doing, but they're being used of spirits, as you said, you know, when you get into sin, you get into dark things and you get used, just like we are to be, you know, vessels of the Holy Spirit, they are vessels without the Holy Spirit, so there's another spirit. So that's happening to the people and it's happening to the culture. And again, you know, as a whole and individually, and the thing is that, that again, it's not like they know what they're doing. Like, you know, when, when they start doing these things, like, give me, let me give you an example. And I'm not, I'm not speaking about particular individuals, but let me give you an example of how you don't have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, the Supreme Court actually, you know, passed, uh, make, handed down rulings, which basically have ended up overturning gender and overturning sexuality and overturning marriage. Um, and there were three particular decisions you know in, one is 2003 one in 2013 and then basically the destruction of marriage as we know it in 2015 and the thing is the amazing thing is the time of the gods remember was june particularly the last days of june near the summer solstice well the first decision you know which normalized this sexuality happened was came down june last days of june the days of the goddess on june 26th the second one, 10 years later, the, the destruction of the Defense of Marriage Act happened June, last days of June, days of the goddess, June 26th, same exact day near the summer solstice. The, the destruction of marriage as we know it happened June, last days of June, days of the goddess near the summer solstice, June 26th, the exact same day. Now, nobody that the justices are not doing this on purpose. They have no idea what they're doing. That's what how you can be influenced by this. You can be an avatar without even realizing it. Yes. And so it all happened. And let me let me throw this in. We all remember, you remember this, Alan. We all remember it. The day that marriage was basically overturned after thousands of years. That night, remember that night that the White House was lit up in the colors of the rainbow? Yeah. And remember the rainbow, you know, it's supposed to be of God, but that's not, but when it's linked to altered sexuality, that you're dealing with a goddess. That's the link. That why is that linked to it? It's not an accident. It is because of that. And so it's basically as the goddess saying, listen, I own the White House now. I own this nation now. And the thing is, so that night was the 10th of Tammuz, the ancient day, the 10th of Tammuz. Now, when I looked on the ancient calendar of Babylon, I found an inscription that says, the 10th day of Tammuz is appointed to cast a spell to cause a man to love a man. That was the day that marriage was altered for a wow. man to marry a man. And they had no idea. They had no idea what they're doing. But this is the ancient mystery. It has to manifest. And, and again, interesting, the, the flag, the rainbow flag, rainbow symbolic of possession, which is fascinating. Again, the book is The Return of the Gods. The link is in the description of this video. you got to get a copy. So what's the antidote then? I know there's yeah. hope. There's hope for yes. the future. I know you're full of hope. You've been preaching revivals <laughs> coming. What is the antidote to the gods? I'm preaching we have to pray for revival and we have to do everything for revival because without revival, it's lost. And yes. that's if my people. Yeah. So. So, yeah, the thing is, the last part of the book, um, Alan, and you know me, the end of the books are always going to I always have always there's always going to be hope. <laughs> Thank what God. Do we do about it? Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the last section is the which is the largest section is called the other God. You know, mm -hmm. you know, interesting because the word for, you know, the, the word for the gods in, in Hebrew is the word Elohim. That's a plural word. And that's the God. But it's also the name of God. So you're going to have the you are going to have God or the gods, you know, and the antidote to the gods is God. The antidote to the spirits is the spirit. 
You know, God is so much stronger. Remember, you know, the name of Jesus has actually cast this out before. The thing is that so many believers are on the defense of it when we should be on the offense. You know, that we've got the power of this. You know, you know, if the dark is darker, it is time to get brighter. And, you know, many believers have prayed, I wish I could live in biblical times. Well, congratulations, because you <laughs> are living in biblical times. You know, you know, when the biblical times were basically days of Moses, he stood against the gods. Yeah. Days of Elijah stood against the gods. You know, Jeremiah stood against the gods. You know, the Maccabees stood against the Greek gods. Paul stood against the Roman gods. We are, you know, the, the people of God are called to stand against the sacred cows, the golden calves, the, the, the you know, the idols and the gods of man. Well, they're back. And that gives us a chance to rise to greatness. That's the whole point. But we have to be strong. And one of the things I say that, you know, remember Gideon, he could not, he was called to be a great man of God, a hero, but he couldn't do that until he first dealt with that, 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 altar of Baal in his backyard. So the thing is, listen, God wants you to be great. This is this is an hour for greatness and we got to be strong. God will empower you. But if there's anything in your life that is not of God, that's a stronghold for these gods, you know, whatever it is, sexuality or materialism, whatever it is, it, you got to break it. You got to break that altar. You know, you got to get get rid of that and God will use you. But then now we are we have the power of the of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. You know, Moses when he when he crossed the Red Sea, he sang a song and he said, "Micha mocha ba'elim Adonai, who is like you, Lord, among the gods? They're nothing compared to you. We have got a power that is greater than every other power, but we have to rise to. We cannot live on the defensive. We must live on the offense. We have the answer, and that's what God is going to bless. But it is time. You know, these are yes, great challenges, great darkness, but God has given us a great light, and He has given us. He's called us to a great hour." to rise to greatness in the power of the one true living most high God. Come on. I know if you're watching this right now, you feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I know you've kind of been sitting in stunned silence listening to this revelation. But if you're getting this, just write, I receive in the comments. And in a moment, Rabbi, I want you to pray for us that we would rise to the occasion to meet these gods with the God. But first, we're heading into a new year, 2023. And yes. folks are very, very, it's a precarious moment we're in in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. As you pray for your church and your people and for the body of Christ, what do you what do you sense the Holy Spirit saying? What should we be looking for as we're heading into 2023? Well, you know, without, again, without revival, there's no hope for America. The only hope we have is revival. And the thing is, revival has to start with God's people, you know, and so much of the church has been on the defensive, has been, you know, paralyzed so much, you know, they, they don't know what to do. It's, 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 it's like the, the, the world is calling the shots and we're just reacting. That's not what God called us to remember, you know, you know, think about, you know, the, the beginning of the age. The gods were there, and yet the book of Acts was there. You know, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a, a power, and we have to move to that. You know, we just, you know, this is talking, now we're talking very uh, extremely um, uh, uh, contemporary, and that is that, you know, we just saw, like, for instance, the House of Representatives was, you know, was in conservative hands, and yet the same today when we're doing this, I know we'll broadcast it, uh, we also saw Republicans join in with the Democrats about a, a a bill That's that exactly actually, right. you know, actually goes against biblical marriage. And so, you know, it's not going to be politics that saves us. We've got the you've got the power. And let, let me let me put this, Alan. I, I, this is OK. Yes. The day that the day that I finished the book. OK. Um, and, and, and think about this, you know, um, you know what what we're talking about is coming against the gods and that, and when and in in the bible when there was revival it wasn't shown necessarily by tent meetings they what they did is they broke the altars on the high places they broke the altars of the gods that was revival mm -hmm. well the biggest the most brazen altar we have is the altar of abortion literally i mean offering that well the day i finished the book the return of the gods was june 24th uh, that was the day that the altar of abortion <laughs> broke broke began to crack open God, where he overturned Roe versus Wade. Now, now, th I don't believe that's an accident. Yeah. And it's not about, listen, you know, that that's the end of the fight, but by, by no means, it's the beginning. But remember something, the broken altar, we've never really seen this in America. The broken altar to God is a sign of potential revival. Because this is the sign of Josiah. Remember King Josiah? Yes. Broken altar, broken altar. God is giving us encouragement. He's telling us, listen, nothing's impossible with me. It doesn't matter how how overwhelming, you know, for when the, when the gods were in Egypt, they were like overwhelming, you know, in Rome, they looked overwhelming, but the power of the gospel is stronger 
And so God is giving us an encouragement that we got to move forward. You know, spread the gospel, be bold, be strong, speak, uh, pray boldly, you know, believe boldly, act boldly, live all out for God. And there's no telling what he will do. He's given us a sign. The altar is, has been cracked open by the hand of God. That means there can be revival. I think we're ready. I think folks are stirred up, fired up to see through your book that the hand of God has been at work through all of this and that he is ready and willing to move on our behalf. Would you pray for us that we would yes. rise to this challenge? Yes. Father, we just praise you and thank you, Father, for this day, this moment, Lord. Lord, I ask your blessing on everyone who's listening, Lord. We ask your power upon them. Father, first of all, we turn away from any darkness, any idol, any altar, any sin, anything that is of the gods, anything that's of darkness, we don't want it, Lord. And we'll take the steps, Father, because we want revival, beginning with us, Lord. We're not just going to pray for revival. We're going to live in revival. We choose revival. Father, we want to live as, as Gideon did. We want to live as Moses, Elijah, Lord, Paul, Father, Josiah. Lord, Lord, help us to rise, Father, to overcome that we would be lights in this age, not only in the culture, but in our own lives. So, Lord, we declare victory. We declare your power. We declare that the power of the living God is greater than any other power in on earth, in America, or in our lives, Father. And we, Lord, we commit to rising in the power of the Spirit, Lord, to live a victorious life for such, where we were born and placed here for such a time as this, Lord. We thank you, Lord, and we commit to it, Father. And Lord, bring revival upon this land. Pour out your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, upon this land. Lord, break open the altars of the gods and let revival yes. come. Lord and Father, we thank you, Lord, and we lift this up in the name that is above every name that is named, the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of all lords, and the God above all gods. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, if you receive that right, I receive in the comments. And the book is The Return of the Gods. The link is in the description of this video. By the way, Rabbi Jonathan, you've got an amazing website, hopeoftheworld.org. There's so Thank many you. resources there that people can get. Some of them absolutely free. You can get. You send out a magazine regularly full of of, of ancient wisdom and mysteries. It's just outstanding. Yeah, we want to set. We yeah, that's that's the ministry. The ministry is to get the gospel out and get the word out and get get salvation out. And so if, yeah, if they go to if you go to hopeoftheworld.org, you'll get the free gifts. You get CDs. You'll get prophetic updates. That's what we're here for. You know that that's why we're here. Uh, yeah, and thank you for mentioning that. That, that I appreciate. Oh that. well, I'm telling you, as far as websites are concerned, yours has more content per square <laughs> inch than about any other one I've been to. Seriously, ladies and gentlemen, we will put the link for that as well in the description of this video. Go there and make yourself available to all of those resources. Yes, Rabbi. And I'm hoping also that when people get the get the return of the gods, that they'll also get it not just for themselves, but for people in their lives. Because everyone, everybody has people in their lives who are very much in bondage to this, and that's what we're praying. We, we spoke off the air. Yes, we're praying that this touches the culture, and and God has His way. And everyone will enjoy it. It is a page turner, mm -hmm. and it's it's so mysterious and eye opening. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what their denomination, whether they're a believer or an unbeliever. You get this for them for Christmas. I'm telling you you, they'll thank you for it. And who knows, I think you might see an amazing transformation in that person's life. So get the book, buy it in boxes and just hand it out to your leadership. Here it is, The Return of the Gods. And there he is, Rabbi <laughs> Jonathan Kahn. Thank you so much thank for being you. with us. Thank you, Alan. It's always a joy.